All right. For this lecture, the topic is uh, changes of phase, also put as phase changes. And what does that mean overall? Well, you know, we've talked about the different states or phases of matter being solids, liquids, gases, plasmas. We've talked about you know, the different, what makes those things different, and essentially it's the amount of motion over all the atoms and the molecules that make up those uh, states of matter. Uh, solid, there's motion, but they're all the atoms and the molecules are pretty well confined to stay in the sort of same area, in their crystal structure or that amorphous structure. In liquids, all the atoms are much more free to kind of move around, but are generally still confined to stay within the material, whatever the liquid. And then in gases, you basically just have this free flow of the atoms or the molecules of that gas. Right? They're pretty free to move just about anywhere. We've also talked about then temperature and how you change an object's temperature. Well, how do you change temperature? You add heat. And then the last lecture we just talked about was, well, how do you add heat? There was conduction, convection, radiation, the three ways of heat, uh, essentially transferring heat. Finally, we're going to talk about how do you get from one of those phases to another? Right? How does a liquid become a solid? Or a solid become a liquid? Or not necessarily just how does that happen, but what's the process? What takes place when that happens? So there you go, we got four phases. Ice, water, steam are three phases of uh, H2O. Solid, liquid, and gas. Plasma is our fourth phase, but again, we're not worried too much about plasma. So a phase change or a change of phase occurs when you change from one phase or one state of matter to another. How does that happen or what needs to happen? Well, just like when you heat something up or you, you, uh, so you increase or decrease something's temperature, you're adding heat or you're taking heat away. When you want to change the phase of a material, you still, same sort of idea, you need to somehow add or remove energy from that system. So remember, heat is just a form of energy, so you can add or remove heat from that system. So when we're talk just talking about the solid, liquid, and gas phases of uh, matter, then generally speaking, when you want to go from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a gas, you need to add energy to that system. Or another way of saying that is energy needs to be absorbed by that system. Versus if you go the other way, from a gas to a liquid or from a liquid to a solid, energy needs to be removed from that system. So kind of overall picture is just like heating up uh, or increasing the temperature of a liquid, you add energy to it. If you add enough energy to it, you get it to that point where it's just ready to become a uh, gas, you need to keep adding energy to it and eventually you turn all that liquid into a gas. So first off, we're going to look at changing between liquids and gases. Essentially, either you have a liquid that changes to a gas or you have a gas that changes to a liquid. If you have liquids changing to gases, the general term for that is evaporation and it takes place at uh, the surface of the liquids. Right? So the reason that we say it needs to take place at the surface of the liquids is because if we think about our atomic picture, right, where liquids, gases, salt, they're all made up of atoms and molecules. So if you think about the liquid, all those molecules are pretty, you know, much more together than they are in a gas. They can still kind of flow around pretty easily, right, but they're confined to kind of sort of stay in the same area of volume there. So all of those molecules are moving around and they're being held together by, in fact, uh, electromagnetic forces, which again, we haven't talked about that much, but just keep in mind that there is, the reason that they're still held together is because there's a bit of a force to pull them together. However, given that all these molecules, all these atoms that make up the liquid are in motion, and it's not one amount of motion, so each atom, you look at one atom, it's moving very, very fast, you look at another atom, it's not moving quite that fast, right? There's a kind of a mix or a spectrum of speeds that these liquids, the atoms that make up these liquids have. What happens is those atoms that are at the very surface of the liquid, the very, maybe the top of the liquid here, some of those atoms are moving very, very fast. And in fact, they're moving fast enough to sort of overcome that electromagnetic uh, force that's keeping them together 
And when that happens, they leave the liquid. So you have an atom just has enough uh, kinetic energy, enough velocity, in order to get away from all the other atoms that make up that liquid. And there you go, that's one atom of that liquid that's evaporated and is now in a gaseous form. It's free to move around again. So, thinking back again, or keeping in mind our atomic picture, it's the atoms at the surface of the liquid that are moving fast enough to get out of that liquid. Essentially, they're going to evaporate. They're going to become turned to that gas phase. So thinking about that for a second, you recall that the temperature of an object is just essentially a measure of the average amount of energy, of, uh, or the average amount of motion of all of the atoms that make up that uh, object. If you start taking away the most energetic atoms from an object, right, the ones that are moving the fastest are the ones that are getting out, then what you're doing, or what's happening, is that overall, when the highest energy ones leave, what you're left with is a lower average of uh, energy. So it's another way of saying that evaporation essentially pulls, takes energy overall away from the object and cools the object down. So that's why you say evaporation is generally a sort of a cooling sort of process because the most energetic atoms are the ones that are evaporating. So what you're left with are the less energetic ones. So this is why, for instance, while well, they're showing the dog tongue here, and dogs don't have sweat glands, so to cool off, they uh, stick their tongue out and pant, and their tongues are wet, and that water on their tongue evaporates, so that the water that's evaporating is that high energy water, and it's taking, essentially taking energy away from the dog overall. And the panting is essentially just uh, speeding up that process, it's pushing air up along the water in order to more easily allow that evaporation to happen. So these other examples of, well, like, you have a, a wet cloth and you put it over yourself, then the wet, the water in that cloth is going to start evaporating and it's pulling heat away from you. The, I don't know, most familiar example is just sweat, right? So a dog pants in order to give off its heat to cool down. Uh, humans have sweat glands. So we sweat, we release uh, water through uh, our pores. And that water then can evaporate. So that evaporation again is pulling the most energetic water molecules away. So what's left is less energetic and we cool down. So still talking about moving between the gas and the liquid, the opposite essentially of evaporation is what we call condensation. It's when a gas converts to a liquid. So this condensation and it's essentially just the opposite of evaporation. When you have a liquid, like say you have a, a cup of water, and in the air there's water molecules, there's water vapor, sometimes one of those water molecules uh, that's, uh, that's uh, in the air is going to be moving, right? they're all moving randomly, they're moving at different speeds. So one of them is moving maybe then towards the surface of the liquid, towards the, the water in your glass, and it's not moving too fast, so that when it hits, it doesn't really rebound enough to get away from the liquid. It sort of hits and then gets stuck. And there you go. That gas just converted back into a liquid, condensed into a liquid. So since condensation is the opposite of evaporation, evaporation uh, generally cools the substance down, the liquid down that's evaporating. Condensation is the opposite. It will heat up the substance. So essentially you're adding, just adding more uh, more energy than that gas molecule. It's moving much faster than all the liquid molecules. And even though it's not moving very fast compared to all the gas molecules, it's still moving much faster than liquid molecules. So when it comes in, it collides with those molecules and starts them moving a bit more, so, right? So it increases the overall motion of the atoms in the liquid, and increases in temperature or heat. Right here. Understanding then how evaporation tends to cool uh, liquids down and condensation uh, heats liquids up, you can start to make sense more of why you're not really usually just interested in how hot a day is, um, but also how humid it is. In this area, it doesn't usually get that humid, so we don't worry about that very much. But if you go to an area that is very humid, you'll notice that it can be rather uncomfortable if it's hot and very humid. So the reason being is that humid is just saying that 
the air is very moist or there's a lot of water vapor in the air. So say on a 90 degree day, right? 90 degree day in San Jose versus a 90 degree day in New Orleans. New Orleans is much more humid, much more water vapor in the air. And in a sense, if you look back at this evaporation, um, in order for the liquid to evaporate, there sort of needs to be some space for the malt, for that atom to leave the liquid and start moving up and becoming a gas, right? If there's a lot of gas particles already up here, then when that gas, when that atom starts to move up, it, maybe it hits one of those already and it comes right back down. So essentially the more gas molecules are up here, the less uh, evaporation is going to happen. So that's just another way of saying that the more humid it is, right, the more water vapor there already is in the air, the less evaporation is going to happen when you sweat. Right? So that sweat's not going to evaporate, it's just going to sit on your skin and you're not going to cool down. Uh, one way you can actually measure the humidity and an example of evaporation being a cooling process is using uh, this uh, device, which is essentially two thermometers, and you take essentially one of the thermometers, you wrap it around in a wet cloth or something to keep that uh, part of the thermometer damp. So you have a wet bulb and you have a dry bulb, the bulb just being where the reservoir of that liquid is for the thermometer. And well, essentially the difference in the temperature readings of these thermometers can indicate how humid it is uh, in the air. If uh, there's a large difference in the temperatures, does that indicate a high or a low humidity? Would you take a second to think about that? So in fact, it indicates a low humidity because it's indicating that there's a lot of evaporating cooling going on, or that's able to go on. So one way to think about that is that for the wet bulb, it has a lot of water around it. So if that water is able to evaporate, then uh, it will cool the wet bulb down. However, if it's very humid, right, there's a lot of water molecules in the air, it's not very easy for evaporation to happen, then that wet bulb, there's not going to be a whole lot of evaporation, so there's not going to be a, a cooling, much of a cooling uh, effect on the wet bulb. I mean, there's very little difference between the temperatures there. So large temperature difference, so you very low humidity. So um, some other uh, examples of this kind of changes between uh, liquids and gas phases. Well, for one, you know, just uh, regular water vapor that's in the air, if it warms up, that warming, so you have like this little like kind of small patch of water vapor, small volume of water vapor, if it warms, remember it's gonna, that warming's gonna expand it, and as it expands, it's gonna cool down, and if it expands enough, it cools down enough, then it wants to condense back into liquid, and this is why we get liquid water drops in the air, very tiny drops, and so like fog or clouds. And similarly here, like when you're pouring out um, a teapot, uh, you pour out the water, and when you see, you see this like uh, steam coming off, right? So water vapor you actually can't see, as a gas form, you can't see. So um, what happens is as that steam, as that water vapor uh, leaves your pot, it gets to expand very quickly. This is moving out of the air, it expands very quickly, it cools off a lot, and it forms into water droplets. So you actually see that liquid in the air, right? Just very, very tiny droplets. Okay, so the sort of extreme, I guess, of evaporation is uh, boiling. And we're still talking about going from a liquid to a gas here. But it turns out that if uh, you raise the temperature of the liquid high enough, then evaporation essentially starts to occur all over in the liquid. And yeah, so the, the temperature that you need to raise a liquid to in order for it to boil uh, depends on the pressure. When you boil a liquid, and you've probably all seen this, if you stick a glass of water um, on some kind of heating element, Right? You start to see bubbles form at the bottom, and then those bubbles sort of, uh, if it's boiling, the bubbles will expand and rise to the surface, right? And then kind of burst at the surface and that uh, water uh, vapor will 
release. Right? So what's happening is once you start forming bubbles, right, then uh, the bubbles on the inside, uh, there's now a surface of a liquid, and evaporation can start to happen inside those bubbles. Right? So you start to um, get more and more gas being uh, created, right? so the bubbles will expand, they grow, and if they expand, they're also getting less dense, so they get become buoyant and get pushed up to the surface until they actually uh, hit the, the surface of the liquid and then burst, release all that gas into the air. So, um, I guess I said that the boiling point uh, for the temperature of the object, that materials will boil out, the liquids will boil out in particular, depends on pressure and obviously Hopefully, obviously, it also depends on the material, the liquid itself. Right? So, just examples um, at atmospheric pressure, right? The same pressure, nitrogen, as we've seen or talked about briefly before, nitrogen boils at minus three hundred and twenty degrees Fahrenheit. It's a very, very low temperature. Nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, will boil and become gas. Versus at atmospheric pressure, H two O will boil at two hundred and twenty. 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So same pressure, right? Vastly different temperatures. These are different materials. So they're going to boil at different temperatures. And the temperature that it, these things will boil at is generally just decreases as the pressure decreases. So um, an interesting example of that boiling uh, temperature for that point the liquid will boil at, how it depends on pressure, you can see that very easily if you are able to reduce the pressure enough, water itself will boil at room temperature. So regularly at atmospheric uh, pressure, water boils again at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but again reducing that pressure is going to reduce the boiling temperature. So if you just keep reducing that pressure, you can reduce that pressure, eventually the boiling temperature is just whatever it is now, 72 degrees or something, room temperature. And so water will boil at room temperature. I'll show you an example of this in a second. Um, but this is also why cooking things, uh, particularly if you're going to boil something at high altitudes, uh, is sort of more difficult, or it takes longer generally, or you don't actually ever uh, get things as hot as you might think you did, or you think you would. The reason being that at that lower pressure, the water is boiling at a lower temperature. So maybe you get high enough, the water is actually boiling at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 12 degrees less than you thought it was. So that's why it might take, say, longer to hard boil an egg way up in the mountains than it does at uh, sea level. All right, so let's see if we can see an example of water boiling at room temperature. So there's water. It's inside of a, a cup. And that cup is inside of a, a larger container that's being uh, vacuum pumped out. There's no change being done in the temperature to boil this. This is literally just lowering the pressure enough to get water boiling. It's touching everything to show that it's not heating at this point. It's not heat that's boiling this uh, water. And it's hard to see, but the temperature is really, it's about 20 degrees Celsius or uh, some 60, 68 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So one more example of this is, well again, just lowering the pressure that a, a liquid is experiencing enough will lower the boiling point. If you recall, if you can cause something to expand, to lower its density, then you'll lower its pressure. So what this guy's gonna do is he has uh, just water in a syringe, right? no heating element around, nothing like that. And if you close off the syringe, and there's a little bit of air in there with the liquid, and all you have to do is pull out the syringe, and you're gonna expand the air that's in there Right, so you're going to lower its density, you're going to lower that pressure quite a bit, and you just pull it out enough, that water's going to start boiling in the syringe. So it closes off the valve, 
And again, it's not boiling because it's hot. All right, there you go. You just pulled out that plug, lowered the pressure quite a bit. So now the boiling point of that liquid or that water is room temperature. So no flame, no heating element. It's not changing its temperature really. All you're doing is lowering the pressure. And just quickly going back to remembering sort of why that is, why is this that's the case, right? So remember I said that in the uh, air, if there's a lot of water vapor in the air, if it's very humid, then there's already a lot of gas sort of in this space. That means that the atoms in the liquid have a difficult time coming out of the liquid. So they have a difficult time evaporating. So what you're doing, if you lower the pressure that the liquid is in, you expand this area very quickly. So you're essentially, by expanding this, you're lowering this pressure, you're making a lot more room for that liquid uh, to actually come out and turn into a gas. So that's one way of understanding why when you lower the pressure, uh, you can actually decrease or cause the liquid to boil um, you know, room temperature. Okay, so we talked about now between uh, gases and liquids, liquids are going to gases, gases are going to liquids. It's one sort of phase change area. Uh, the other one, other main one, is when liquids become solids and when solids become liquids. So if a solid is becoming a liquid, let's say that it's melting, so just like very uh, common form of melting that everybody's used to, you have ice cubes, ice cubes melt, becomes a liquid water. And again, remembering that in each of these cases, if you want to change a phase from uh, one material or one phase from material to another, you need to add or remove energy from it. So by going from a solid to a liquid, you actually need to be add you need to add energy to that liquid in order to cause it to uh, become or sorry, add energy to a solid in order for it to become a liquid. And typically we're gonna think about that energy being added as uh, heat being transferred in some way. So for instance if you just place uh, some ice cubes on a table, right, then heat is going to transfer from the air into the ice cubes, and it causes that ice to melt. Interestingly enough, there's a metal called uh, gallium that melts right around room temperature, a little bit above room temperature. Right? So what that means is that if you have solid gallium and it's sitting in a room, maybe it's solid there because it's not quite a bit of melting temperature. But all you got to do is put that gallium in your hand. Your hand is warmer than the room temperature, right? Your hand's generally around 98 degrees. And so your hand's going to add a bit of heat to that uh, gallium, and it's enough to actually melt the gallium there. So just examples of different uh, materials melting. All right, so we got melting, solids, converting to liquids. I need to add some energy. So here's the liquid. Uh, the opposite of that would be a liquid converting to a solid, otherwise known as freezing. And again, the ener energetically, the process is the opposite too. Energy needs to be removed from a liquid in order to convert it to a solid. So an example of this is, say, uh, lava. Right? Lava is a molten or liquid, lo liquid uh, rock. It'll freeze. It'll go from its liquid lava form to solid rock, right? When it transfers a bunch of heat into the ocean, the seawater. Right? So you have a liquid, uh, this lava, it hits the seawater, it transfers a ton of heat to the seawater. So you remove a bunch of energy from that liquid, it uh, forms a solid. Um, at the same time, right, all that uh, heat going from the lava into the seawater into the ocean, right? you actually have the reverse process where you're essentially dumping a bunch of energy into that water that's right around the lava. So you dump a bunch of energy into that liquid, it actually uh, boils. It'll evaporate and become a gas. So you actually have that freezing process here along with the uh, sort of evaporation or boiling process we talked about earlier. You know, we always want to keep in mind our uh, atomic picture here of uh, matter. That being that it's all made up of these atoms um, or molecules that are all kind of jiggling around. And remembering that the 
more energy overall in the material, the more sort of movement those atoms and those molecules will have. So if you keep this picture in mind, it starts to make sense why if you dump enough energy into a solid, right, where a solid is just a bunch of these uh, particles and they're all sort of just jiggling around in place, if you dump enough energy in, they start to move a lot, and they start to move more and more and more, and eventually the electromagnetic bonds that are kind of holding them into that sort of solid form, their motion becomes enough to sort of overcome those bonds and you just start to get this free flowing sort of movement and now you have a liquid. Right? So it's like a melting process. If you go in reverse, right, you have all these thing, atoms moving around a liquid and if you can remove enough energy then all the motion slows down and they slow down enough where the electromagnetic forces between them start to be able to hold them in place more and you, again you start to get this uh, eventually a solid where they're all sort of held together. Same idea when you're going from liquids to gases. Right? In liquids, again, all these atoms are just kind of zooming, moving around, right? But they're still sort of confined to the liquid. But you give enough energy, you increase the overall motion, and so they're moving faster and faster and fast enough that eventually they just start to shoot out the liquid, and you get a gas, you just get free flowing atoms in the air, or free, whatever in the space that they're in. So one other process that is not as common, but turns out that you can actually go, say, directly from a solid to a gas, or from a gas to a solid, and sort of skip that liquid phase in the middle. So going from a solid directly to a liquid uh, is what we call sublimation. Whether or not a material will sublimate, meaning whether it will go from a solid to straight to a gas, depends on the uh, pressure that that, uh, that's, that salt is under. So as it turns out, solid carbon dioxide, which is also called dry ice, will sublimate it at atmospheric pressure, meaning that if you have solid uh, dry ice, so you have a piece of dry ice, then in normal atmospheric pressure, the pressure we're in right now, and in normal room temperatures, well above its uh, sublimating temperature, then the CO2 that makes up that solid skips the phase of being a liquid and just pops right off of the solid and becomes a gas. So it happens even just in room temperature, um, but remember from our heat transfer talk that air is not a very good conductor of heat. Air is a pretty good insulator, meaning it doesn't allow heat to flow very well. So um, if you have dry ice just sitting in air, you'll notice the sublimation. Um, but it doesn't happen very quickly, the sublimation being essentially that CO2 gas is coming off of it. If you put that dry ice into water, water is a much better conductor than air, even though it's not as good as, say, aluminum or uh, gold, but it's still much better than uh, air, so it conducts heat away much better than the air, and so when you put a dry ice into water, you actually uh, will cause that sublimation to happen much, much quicker or much more rapidly. Um, and you can make these big like, kind of clouds of CO2 gas. So, let's see. So here you go, you have little pieces of uh, CO2, chunks of solid CO2, and you can see sublimation happening in the CO2, in the gas form of CO2 that's forming directly from the solid. Okay. Um, and it turns out, well, CO2 is actually uh, more CO2 gas is more dense than air, which is why the CO2 gas that's coming off of these uh, solids is sort of staying on the table level. It doesn't rise up because it's less dense than the air. Okay. So it's sort of sink in the air. And what he's doing by pushing around is showing that when you move them, the fact that CO2 is more dense means it sort of forms a layer of CO2 gas underneath the solid, which allows it to uh, move very easily. It's very very low friction because the solids are actually in contact with that surface anymore. Um, yeah, you're welcome to watch this video. It talks a bit more about it. The fact that the water, the little drop is there, that's not CO2 liquid. That's actually water, water vapor that was in the air that is condensing onto that CO2. Continues to go on and show you a bit more dramatic scale. If you, right, so if you drop a chunk of CO2 into a beaker, 
get a lot of the CO2 forming, but again, it's more dense in the air, so it pushes its way out of the beaker, but it falls down because it's not going to rise up in that air. And you continue going up in scale. You can create this whole sort of fog. Pretty cool stuff. Careful if you do that at home, you don't really want to stick your head in that. So in this image, you can see maybe even better the CO2 gas that's moving away from the solid, right? The solid sublimating and becoming gas, but it's just sort of pushing its way along the surface, it's not rising up in the air. But regardless, this is still a process that's moving sort of from solid to liquid. What needs to happen is energy needs to be added to that solid. And, and in the situation in the picture here, that uh, heat is coming from the air. Air is uh, giving off heat to that uh, solid and it causes the celebration. So, we pretty much talked about the main, those major uh, phase changes, right? Liquid to gas, gas to liquid, that was uh, evaporation or condense, condensation, solid to liquid or liquid to solid, you have melting or freezing. Right? So, going back to the idea of where energy gets involved or how energy is involved in there, because essentially if you're going from away from solid form into liquid or into gas or directly from solid to gas, then you need to be adding energy in order to make that happen. So remember like ice, if you want ice to melt, you've got to add energy to it and that energy can just come from the air around it. Um, if you want to go the other way from a gas to a liquid, from a liquid to a solid or from a gas directly to a solid, didn't talk about that, but that's sort of the opposite of sublimation, uh, I believe it's called deposition. I don't need to worry about that much. So. But basically from a gas to a liquid or from a liquid to a solid, right, you need to remove energy from that system. And typically you remove energy by transferring heat in some way. So the amount of energy that you need in order to cause a phase change to happen, um, as you might expect, depends on the material, right? so what it's made of, whether it's CO2, H2O, uh, aluminum, gallium, right? the type of material, and uh, the amount of material that you want to change its phase. Right? So the amount of energy you need to melt, say, um, a, just a small ice cube is not as much as you need to melt a large block of ice. So as it turns out, the amount of energy that you need to go, say, from a liquid to a gas, from a gas to a liquid, either way, that amount of energy is what you call heat of vaporization. So vaporization makes more sense from liquid to gas, but it's actually the same amount of energy to go in the opposite direction. It just needs to be taken out. So both ways, it's the heat of vaporization. And similarly, um, going from a solid to a liquid or from a liquid to a solid, it's what we call the heat of fusion. And again, if it's from a solid to a liquid, that's that amount of heat needs to be added. If from a liquid to a solid, that heat needs to be taken away. Either way, call it the heat of the fusion. So let's look at a process here where we imagine, say, starting out with one gram of ice, right? your small little uh, chunk of ice. And if you want that uh, chunk of ice to turn into a liquid, again, you need to add energy to it. That is above and beyond the energy you might have needed to bring that ice up to zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So assuming that ice is already at that freezing temperature, zero degrees Celsius, you still need to add more energy to that ice in order to get it to convert to liquid, to get it to convert to water. And it turns out for water, the amount of energy you need to add to one gram of ice in order to change all that ice to a liquid is 80 calories. So remember, calories was just a measurement of heat, or a measurement of energy. So 80 calories is just that amount of energy you need to put into that one gram of ice, even though it's already at zero degrees at freezing temperature, in order to change it to one gram of water, still at that same temperature. So something important about this heats of fusion, heats of vaporization, is that heat is not changing the material's temperature. 
all it's doing is changing the phase of that material. And it'll show the graph of this, maybe make it a little more clear in a second. But continuing along in this process, if we now have one gram of water that's at zero degrees Celsius, right, because we've given enough heat to that ice in order to change all of it to water, it's now all at zero degrees Celsius. We now need to give it a certain amount of heat, a certain amount of energy to raise its temperature up to boiling, 100 degrees Celsius. And if you recall, water is kind of our standard. Its uh, specific heat was one uh, calorie per uh, gram per degree Celsius. So if I want to raise water, one gram of water, 100 degrees Celsius, I need to add 100 calories of heat. This is not changing phase at all. All this is was going back to, you know, heating things up. You just add this amount of heat, you increase the thing's temperature. However, once all of that water has gotten to 100 degrees Celsius to that boiling temperature, we still need to add more heat, more energy, in order to convert that one gram of water into one gram of steam. And again, this has nothing to do with changing its temperature now. This is all about phase changing changing a phase from liquid to gas. So since we're going from water or liquid to our gas, this is the heat of vaporization. And it turns out it's quite a lot of heat, right? 540 calories of heat is needed to change one gram of water to one gram of steam. Once again, I want to point out that those phase change processes for that part where we're having the ice change from or the H2O change from its solid form, ice, to the liquid form, the energy that you're putting in there is all about changing the phase. I mean, that's what we call that the heat of fusion, going from solid to a liquid. And then over here, we're changing all that liquid into a gas. All that is what we call that heat of vaporization. So those energies are not at all changing the temperature of the material, changing the phase of the material. So this is the graph that I was alluding to, where on the vertical axis is the temperature of that one gram of H2O. And on the horizontal axis is um, the amount of uh, heat being added. So if we start all the way over on the left, then it looks like we're at minus 50 degrees uh, Celsius. Right? So even before this picture, we're over even further to the left where we have a gram of ice, but it's below zero degrees Celsius, right? It's at 50, minus 50 degrees Celsius. So what we see is to get that ice um, up to zero degrees, we have to add some heat. So going up into the right, we're adding heat, we're bringing the temperature up. But right when we get to zero degrees, that curve is going to go horizontal, meaning we're adding that heat, we're adding 80 calories of heat, but it's not changing the temperature of that uh, H2O. Once we've added 80 calories of heat, that means we will be able to convert all of that solid H2O into liquid. Now that it's all liquid, we can keep adding heat and we're warming it up again. So that second rise is where the, we have liquid water and it's we're just increasing its temperature from zero to 100 degrees. And then once again, once we get to 100 degrees Celsius, that's the boiling uh, temperature, but it's not going to boil unless we keep adding heat into it in order to convert all of that water into steam. So we keep adding energy, keep adding energy, we're converting some of it, some of that water slowly, 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 slowly. Eventually we add 540 calories of heat to that water. Now we convert it all to steam. Right? If we were to keep adding energy, we would just increase the temperature of that steam. And basically how wide each of these uh, plateaus is, is showing you how much the heat of fusion is, right? 80 calories, versus the heat of vaporization, 540 calories. And finally, as I mentioned before, the reason that we call it just the heat of fusion and just the heat of vaporization is because it's the exact amount of energy if we want the process to go in reverse. Except instead of adding heat, we need to remove heat. So if we imagine the reverse process, if you start out with uh, one gram of steam at 100 degrees Celsius, 
you need to somehow remove 540 calories of heat in order to convert all of that, to condense all of that steam into water, to go from that gas to the liquid form. So same amount of energy, but being removed now instead of being added. And then if we continue to remove heat, remove energy, we would lower the temperature of that water until it got to zero degrees. That's the freezing temperature, but it's not going to freeze until you keep removing heat, and particularly removing 80 calories of heat from that one gram of water at zero degrees Celsius will uh, convert all of that liquid water into ice, salt, uh, solid H2. So essentially that's one reason why there's really only like two names for it. Or there's one name for going from solid to liquid, or liquid to solid fusion, because it's the same amount of energy to go in or go from solid to liquid or from liquid to solid. You just need to add energy to go from solid to liquid, take energy out, and go from liquid to solid. All right, so a couple of questions to wrap this up. You can check yourself here. So when rain droplets form in clouds, what's happening to the air around that rain? Or what's happening to, let's say, the temperature of the air around that rain? Is the air cool? Is it warm? Is it insulated from that? doesn't matter. They're really conducting. I'm not sure what that means. So go ahead and pause for a second. Think it over. Turns out the air is going to be warmed by that uh, process. Right? Rain droplets forming, that means water vapor in the air, gaseous water, gaseous H2O, is condensing in order to form uh, liquid water, to form rain droplets. So remember, if you're going to go from a gas to a liquid, you need to extract energy from it, from the, the gas. So that energy is being extracted, it's going out into the air around it. So essentially, heat's coming out of the water vapor. That heat is going into the air around it. You extract that heat, you can condense it into liquid water and raindrops. Okay, one more. Well, you want that ice to melt. Why is that? Remember, it's all about where you need heat to be added to something, to be removed from something, in order to change its phase. Well, if you want something to melt, heat needs to be added to it. And so if you want that ice to melt, you need heat to come from somewhere and to go into the ice in order to melt it. Like we looked at earlier, for every gram of ice that melts, it's exactly 540 calories of heat uh, are needed, right? So where's that heat coming from? If it's just the ice and the beverages in the container, um, well, maybe a little bit of air too. It's coming from the air, it's coming from the cans. Right? So you're essentially pulling heat, or heat is being transferred from the cans into the ice in order to melt them. So the faster that melting happens, the quicker you're pulling heat out of the cans, the faster you're going to cool them down. And that's it. See you next time.